much for joining us today. Um, this is our, our second webinar in the Transgender Health series. And today our focus is on gender identity and inclusivity. Um, the series kicked off last week, March 31st, and it just happened to be on International Day of Transgender Visibility. Uh, we heard from Dr. Cheryl Holder and Araya Lester, and they spoke about the intersectionality in health disparities, um, specifically for Black transgender women. So today is April 5th, 2021, and we are joined by Dr. Lee Pham and Dr. Allison Tao. And they're going to share their experiences with gender identity, inclusivity, and how they make up and how they are affected by um, the social determinants of health. So this session is being recorded. We will email that to the email addresses that you provided when you registered. We are using Zoom's transcription feature. And for those that are interested, you will receive um, one hour of CE credit from the Medical Library Association today. So Rebecca is, um, she's, oh, she just posted in the chat. So she's going to post the link at the end of the session. You can fill out the evaluation and, and receive that code. I'm going to share my screen. So I'm Nora, Nora Franco. I'm the consumer health librarian, she, her, ea. And I am here at the um, NNLM Pacific Southwest region at the UCLA Biomedical Library. Hi, my, my name is April Wright, and I am the um, <laughs> with NNLM also, and I'm at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, uh, and I'm she, her. Thank you. And you can see my screen, right? With the slides? Yep. All right. Okay. So before we begin, I wanted to start us out with our land acknowledgement. Um, we are all working from home again, but the NNLM PSR at the UCLA Biomedical Library acknowledges our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva communities. So, well, I'm going to have um, April, you're going to monitor the chat for me. So just let me know if there's anything. I'm so we do love our acronym. So I wanted to break these down for those that may not be as familiar with the NNLM. At the top, we have the National Institutes of Health, which is the U.S. leading medical research agency. It's made up of 27 different institutes and centers and the National Library of Medicine, which is the world's largest biomedical library, is one of those 27 different institutes and centers. So the NNLM, or the network of the National Library of Medicine, is where I work and where April works as well. And we are the outreach extension of the NLM. So we're made up of eight different regions, and here in the Pacific Southwest, we serve these different states and territories, April in Baltimore, they serve um, that end of the, the East Coast, part of the East Coast. Here is our mission. I'll go ahead and read that. The mission of the Network of the National Library of Medicine is to advance the progress of medicine and improve the public health by providing all U.S. health professionals with equal access to biomedical information and improving the public's access to information to enable them to make informed decisions about their health. The program is coordinated by the National Library of Medicine and carried out through a nationwide network of academic health sciences libraries, hospital, pharmaceutical, and other special biomedical libraries, public libraries, information centers, and community-based organizations. All of you can sign up as individual members as well. You um, nav navigate to the page nnlm.gov slash user slash join and hit the create an account button and you'll be signed up for our email list. You'll, we won't spam you. We're only going to send you emails about different courses, different webinars, such as the one that you're on today. And with that, I'm gonna introduce our first speaker, Dr. Lee Pham. Dr. Lee Pham, MD, is non-binary and their pronouns are they, them, theirs. 
Dr. Pham received an undergraduate degree in healthcare administration at Washington University in St. Louis and a master's degree in medical sciences at Boston University before attending medical school at the University of Texas in San Antonio. They were a chief resident of the Internal Medicine Residency at Louisiana State University in Shreveport before moving to LA. Their main interests include global health and reducing health disparities, especially in the LGBTQ plus community. Along with general internal medicine, Dr. Pham's specific areas of focus are in LGBTQ plus healthcare, gender affirming care, which includes hormone therapy and HIV care and prevention. They are a credentialed HIV specialist from the American Academy of HIV Medicine. And Dr. Ali Allison Tao, she, her, serves as the regional lead for nuclear medicine in Kaiser Permanente, South California, and as a faculty member for the KP Bernard J. Tyson School of Medicine. She graduated from University of Michigan Medical School and completed her nuclear medicine residency at Stanford University School of Medicine. In addition to her clinical and administrative duties, Dr. Tao devotes her time to training, education, and advocacy for equitable transgender healthcare, both within and outside of KP. She helped found the Multidisciplinary Pediatric Gender Care Clinic at KP San Bernardino County. Dr. Tao also helps facilitate a trans teen support group and is active in her local PFLAG chapter. She lives with her wife of now 23 years and three sons in Newport Beach and enjoys playing double bass and feasting on exquisite sushi. So I'm gonna go back and, and have Dr. Pham um, introduce yourself and if you can share your experiences working and, and coming out as transgender and gender non-binary. Um, and if you can explain, so I know that before you moved to LA, you were, you were working with COVID patients and you were living in an area that was actually not protected with um, anti-discrimination laws and which, which creates a huge potential problem with economic stability, with having a social um, supportive community. So I think that's, that's a really important piece of your story for our audience to hear just that, that dichotomy, right? Of when on one hand, you're literally risking your lives caring for COVID patients and in another sense, you're putting your livelihood at risk because you're not included in those same protections, um, the same protections that your colleagues had. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah, thank you, Nora, for the introduction. Yeah, I wanted to, I guess we can start from there. Um, I was a resident when COVID first came out. So I was practicing in like the South. And one of the things that people aren't really familiar with is that um, most of the southern states um, don't have protections or non-discrimination ordinance for LGBT plus population. You know, I could have gotten um, essentially fired or kicked out of my living places because, you know, um, only certain areas of Louisiana um, had protections and I was teaching and working in a very, in the COVID, basically a COVID floor. Um, that's what they used to call it because it was just full of COVID patients, patients who were, this was in the beginning of the pandemic when um, we really didn't have any, any information about what COVID was besides that it's a virus that had very high possible mortality rates. Um, so I came out when I was a resident um, and you know I and I've been thinking about it for a long time because you know I was never really I didn't really fit into the boxes right I wasn't just like a, a woman or a man I was like I didn't really want to transition to become uh, male and I didn't really fit into what I thought was female. So whenever I learned more about non-binary or gender non-conforming, um, that really resonated with me. And I felt like that was 
who I was, who I am. Um, and it was a moment where I had clarity and felt more comfortable within myself. You know, that that's like the main thing about being um, is authentic within myself. And then because I'm authentic within my, my, myself, I feel more comfortable being um, out. Um, one of the things that I did kind of, you know, there's a, and using they, them pronouns. So one of the things that I ran into was, you know, it, it's a learning curve for everyone and especially for patients. But during this time, you know, in the South, I think there there's an ingrained belief that you should say yes, sir, yes, ma'am, as a sign of respect. And so when patients come in, they are, I get misgendered all the time, sirs, ma'ams. Um, part of me understands that it's a sign of respect, um, but the other part, you know, I use they, them pronouns, and it's not really a time to educate when um, patients are being admitted to the hospital. They're in crisis. They need help. I'm there to help them. You know, it's um, not a time where I'm like uh, to say, actually, I use they, them pronouns, and here's the uh, reasons why, you know. Um, it's time to kind of make sure that they are being taken care of in the hospital because, you know, they're acutely ill, um, especially even more so during, during a pandemic. And, you know, that felt like I had to ignore part of myself in order to take care of, take care of patients. And, you know, that's, after a while, these things um, tend to add up or like be <laughs> very detrimental to, uh, I just read like, yay for you, Tesca. Yes, you, Tesca. Um, add up and, you know, at during that time, everyone's stressed already, you know, um, the hospital is a stressful place to work at. And then you add being a pandemic and then you add in being gender non-conforming. And it's, it's a place where, um, I don't, it's, it's, it's very hard, you know. And when you add in um, living in an area that didn't have, if, if you were living in an area that didn't have protections, then you have this fear of like, oh, if I'm out, so, you know, what if um, I don't have a job or what if I can't um, have um, a safe living environment, then that all of that combines into a place where how are you, how am I supposed to take care of patients to the fullest degree um, to the best um, when I'm also dealing with all of that other things. So, um, and you know, using people will say, I guess, you know, it's a small change like using the pronouns, but whenever people use my, the right pronouns, it gives me a sense of, um, it shows them that, you know, it's affirming, you know, they see me for who I am. Um, and so it's an inclusive environment. It's, it's a way to um, show that you are aware of um, a broader, I guess, rainbow of people and that are human and that, you know, it's the same as knowing um, people's names or asking, you know, what's your name, you know, what's your pronoun, um, and then just using it, you know, I think it's really good to know that, you know, as long as you don't have to, the pressure is like, oh, what if I mess up, and you're like, it's okay, you just correct and move on, and um, I think that's the, the biggest thing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And being open, right? And being open and, and realizing that that there is that there is more than one gender that people identify differently. Um, so I see uh, we do have a question in the chat about the pronouns. Um, we're gonna go ahead and, and let both of our presenters speak and then we'll get to the questions. But um, you know, we probably won't have time for everything. We only have an hour. Um, but you are going to speak on the pronouns um, more in a, in a little bit, Dr. Pham. So we'll get to, to that piece. And then, you know, I, I want to also, you know, um, pass this to 
uh, Dr. Ali Tao and you know let her share share her story as well. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much for sharing yours. So Dr. Tao, Hi, everyone. Ahead. All right, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Pham, thank you, Nora. Hi, everyone. I'm Ali Tao. Uh, thanks for the wonderful introduction, Nora, and here to share my story with you. And I'll and I'll just let and also know that the you know the transgender community is not a monolith. We all have a story, and every story is different, just like everybody else, just like a fingerprint. Everybody's is different, and you know, um, I always think about like, Troy, what's the best way I can describe gender dysphoria for people, especially for those like you know the ninety nine percent of the population who doesn't experience it. I'd say it's like this, you know, um, gender dysphoria is like chronic pain. And chronic pain is one of those things that doesn't get better on its own. It actually just gets worse until you do something about it. But something else about chronic pain is also that at some point you, you, you don't, you lose hope. You feel like you can never be free of it. So um, that, it, it, you know, that discouragement that honestly you just give up. And that's kind of what it, that's what it's like to live with gender dysphoria. And that's a lot of my story too. And one more thing about say gender dysphoria is this, is like, I know all of you woke up this morning and probably take it, you've all taken like thousands of breaths. And I'm not gonna ask you is how many of you really aware of any single one of them? Probably not. You pro you're not aware of it unless there was a problem. And uh, like, and for me, and, but I've been asking you about gender. How do you know your, how do you know your gender? How do you know how you identify? It's, but it's not like you woke up, you just know. It's one thing you woke up, uh, it's not like you, it's not like you woke up one day, looked down, took an inventory of body parts and said, I guess I'm, I'm this or that. You know, um, it just is kind of like, you don't think about it. But like for me, like gender, it's been like that. I've always been aware of it. It's like, I've always been aware of my breathing. It's like when we're breathing, there was because there was something wrong. And even from my earliest memories from like, I was three years old, I remember gender was always part of it. And uh, always wondering why, you know, um, I guess I was a relatively happy kid for just for, you know, you know when I was young from like three, you know, um, I guess because boys and girls used to play together. And my, of course my preference is always just hanging out with other girls. And so that was all right. And, uh, but what happened was, I remember my family, we moved a few years ago and um, just uh, my parents, uh, yes, I'm the product of uh, two oh. tiger parents. So of course, like the good tiger parents, they saved everything, saved every report card, every certificate, everything. But I remember looking at it and I was, looks like I was in kindergarten, first grade, I remember I was actually, well, they said, I was like, I was a happy kid. We kind of a little silly, a little daydreamy, but something happened in second grade where all of a sudden I was very, became very withdrawn where, yeah, I didn't smile much anymore. And I was thinking back, what happened that year? Because that was the year when, and when all of a sudden they started enforcing sort of gender lines kind of gender stereotypes, okay? The boys lined up here, girls lined up here. And uh, and this is what boys do, this is what girls do. And this is what, and this is not what, you know, and uh, and but of course they say that, and anything else is deviant. And, uh, and I always wondered why, how come I couldn't be over there with the rest of the girls? Those are like, oh, they're my best friends. And, um, and um, I couldn't really understand why that was the, you know, that's the way the world was without really good understanding about why I felt the way I felt and why things were harder, things felt hard and things felt so discouraging. And of course, it's growing up in the 70s. I know a lot of you, y'all in information sciences, it's amazing kind of being in a, you can imagine a world back in the 70s pre-internet where there was no access. There was no way to know. There's no way to know that anyone felt the way I felt. Gender dysphoria was still like almost 20 years away from becoming a term and you didn't see anybody. 
There was no, again, power, the visibility matters because I never saw anyone. I didn't, I didn't know anybody else felt the way I felt. All I knew was that's the way I felt. And somehow I wasn't allowed to be doing everything with the girls anymore. I had to kind of just, kind of just hang out on, on the other line. And, um, and also too was, I, but I also knew too that I couldn't talk about it because you know, I didn't know what to say, but my parents, they're both immigrants from Taiwan. They came for their, they both came for their PhDs in engineering you know, in this to the country. And so for them, they're both engineers. And so the world is very, they're, they're engineers. The world's very discreet. And so the world is binary, much like a, like a, like computer, like an operating system at the core, it's all binary. And, uh, and also, you know, the, you know, the, the Chinese culture is conservative, but also uh, we made it harder too. I was the first born male. And for a lot of cultures, you know, understand what that all means. That means that you have to carry on the name. You basically, all the entire burden falls on you to kind of, to carry the name forward. And I had a younger brother. And, and so for me, many, so I was the heir and he was the spare. And so I got all the pressure. He didn't. I think he also resented the fact that nobody cared what he did, you know, even, you know, grades, whether they got an A or C, parents didn't, it didn't matter. It's just, as long as I brought, as long as I was doing okay, then everything was going to be okay. And so, so I even knew at an early age, though, that my life didn't belong to me. And as much as I wanted to go to sleep and wake up as a girl, as my, much as I dreamed that, I knew that wasn't going to happen. And I knew there was such a thing as magic. So that couldn't happen. So um, what choice did I have? And so by, even by like age 10, I remember having the thought that I would never ever be happy because I couldn't really understand why, but I knew I couldn't be me. I didn't, I knew this wasn't what I wanted. And, and so I learned to not just, you know, um, I didn't have like no self-esteem. I had negative self-esteem. I learned to hate myself. And even by height, by, you know, because what choice did I have? And the only thing I could do to, you know, keep my keep me from thinking about this, you know, myself, situation and everything was just um, to be distracted. Like, you know, you heard about some sharks that because they don't have, their gills don't move, they have to stay in motion to get oxygen through it. Um, it's like called uh, obligate ram ventilators. I'm a big nerd, you can tell. And uh, and so like a shark I had to stay in motion. So of course the one way that the two ways I could stay in motion. And so uh, is uh, throw myself into academics and music, which of course made my tiger parents very, very happy. So they thought everything was perfect. I was doing great, even though on the inside I was dying. And by the high, by high school, I was suicidal. And I knew there's not a week that went by, I didn't think about killing myself. But the only relief I ever had was this, in those few moments I could steal away. And I a lot of times find myself in my mom's closet when no one was around. I know I'd try something on, a piece of clothing, a piece of jewelry, just for a moment where I could just be myself. I remember from those moments where I could just exhale and just take a deep breath. And I felt like, I don't know, I could actually kind of it felt like it was really getting oxygen into my body you know just like and um everything was okay for just the briefest of moments but I also knew that I couldn't stay there for long and uh so what do you what all you can do is kind of just kind of pull yourself together and get back out there and keep it keep being the person everybody wants you to be so so it was so in those those few brief you know, those moments that like you know where I could be myself just those you know, just like, it was like a pressure relief out, but that literally those are places where I can get it like to breathe from a tank of oxygen. I felt like it was underwater the rest of the time. So all the way from like before, like five years old, from elementary school, junior high, high school, uh, even undergrad, even into medical school. You know, that's the, that's the only place I could be, be okay. And even the whole time I was just exceedingly lonely and I was just keep moving forward and I was just hurting. And uh, of course, I didn't know, you know, not like I could talk to anyone about it. I knew that. And I knew about shame. That's something no, I, I know, no, no kid should have to bear that burden of, but I knew that it's not something that I could ever tell anyone. So it's so just suffered in silence. I suffered alone. 
And so, but everybody thought I was doing okay because on paper, I kind of was bringing home the grades, the awards, the accolades. So everybody thought it was fine. And so all ended into, um, it did to got it, you know, I guess the distractions, kept swimming, eventually made it to medical school. And there's actually where I met, uh, the kind of hear the story, my future wife, Joyce. And we know we were med school, we're med school classmates. And for her, it's like, um, she just, um, she, um, her best friend had just graduated and she couldn't so, and uh, I don't know, some, you know, we became fast friends, became, you know, became her best friend very quickly. And a lot of, I think what made that friendship special was this, she never expected something from me. Like, like everybody else expected me by a certain way. She just let me be. And uh, we would just, when we hang out, I never, gender wasn't a thing. And we just kind of hung out, we're just gal pals. We were just, uh, and that was, that was really the, one of the only other spaces besides those private moments where I felt like I didn't think about, I could just be, I could breathe. And you know, it's one of those things about best friends, you know, a lot of times you do, you fall in love and before you know it, you're engaged and, and you're about to get married until, this part between third and fourth year, that's where when we get married. But about two months before that, um, something we all course learned at medical school is about informed consent. And I felt like, boy, I need to know what she's getting herself into. And so I felt like, hey, so I remember like two months before we got married, I remember telling her, I was at her apartment, I said, hey, Joyce, I need to tell you something. And it felt like I just, it felt like, I don't know how long it was, probably only about 10 seconds, but it was just hard because I never had shared this name before. But the, and the only language I had back then was in 1997 was, you know, gender dysphoria still wasn't even a term yet. I just said, um, the best way I could explain it is that, hey, you know, um, since I was little, I had cross-dressed on occasion and come all the way through from elementary school, even all the way through into medical school. And um, I remember she just paused, just for a few, like a, a beat, like a pause for like a beat or two. And she kind of remember her just kind of looking, you know, um, saying that, uh, you know, okay, that wasn't, that's different, but um, it's not a deal breaker. We can, we can, you know, we can deal, we can work through that. We can work with that. Okay. And so um, we got married. And so we got married two months later, you know, and then uh, guess what? back to the distractions then the busyness of starting a uh, starting a, a marriage, busyness of finishing fourth year medical school, then the busyness of getting through internship, busyness of residency, then the busyness of starting a career, busyness of starting a family. And of course, kept moving, kept moving, couldn't stop, you know, because I, of course, I felt like if I ever did stop, I would, uh, I'd have to deal with myself. And I, I knew I would just spiral down and, um, I didn't think I'd ever recover. So I just kept moving, kept moving, kept moving. And so um, also, uh, so um, fast forward to 2009, and that was the year uh, our third, um, uh, third of three boys were born. And, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, um, it was finally, at a, it was at a time where um, everything was going well. I had the career I always wanted at the, family I always wanted, you know, friendships I've always wanted. And um, unfortunately, you know, guess what? There was no more distractions. There was nothing left to chase. And of course that by that time it didn't have a name. And the gender, like gender dysphoria, like chronic pain only gets worse over time. It doesn't get better. Even though I was running away from it, it was there and, and there it was when the smoke cleared. And um, so I, I did, um, I, I did the one thing I did what this is what I decided to do it was that um, like uh, I remember end of that summer 2019 uh, 2009 I remember uh, going to taking a surf lesson and uh, you know living down here in Orange County and I remember like like I, I, I really enjoyed it but I kept but the thought came to me is this maybe if I became an accomplished surfer Maybe then I have an identity that I could live with and then I could push this all out of the way. And um, I think it's like, and also for surfing, it, it would be by far, it was the most macho thing I've ever attempted. And uh, 
so I started um, started surfing. I started surfing like first time one one morning a week, two morning, then two, then three. I surfed like my life depended on it. I surfed uh, like I um, I'd get up at like four thirty in the morning. I'd be I'd be leaving the house by five. A lot of times I get end up at the beach and I'd be paddling out at five thirty even before the lights, even before the sun came up. I'd surf to moonlight and I surfed and surfed like my life depended on it because I thought it literally did. But also surfing was one of those things most demanding activity I've ever done. So surf and so it was after three months, I had lost thirty pounds. And by six months, I hadn't, I'd lost more. I actually, I didn't lose, I didn't just have a six pack. I actually had an eight pack. Of course, it's kind of hard to imagine now because this is a middle-aged um, Asian mom bod. And so thank you, hormones. And, uh, and uh, gosh, it's just like, and, and also just, you know, um, you know, I remember like having like, you know, my dead big delts, big lats, you know, big triceps. And for the first time in my life, I had a, like a like like a male body, a masculine body, and for me, my I was been my whole life's been I've, it's been relatively androgynous because I was at I was at war with it. I hated it. I hate looking in the mirror. I hate looking at myself. And so, and I remember one day um, I was taking off my shirt, and I remember my wife Joy said, "Hey, ooh, I like what I see. Stop there for a second. And she was showing me how to make a muscle. Got no muscles to. She was showing me how to flex and pose. I never had anything to flex or pose before. So. So uh, did that, and I kept thinking maybe I should be. I, I, I thought, you know, hey, I got, I, I'm here now, but I thought I should be better, but I wasn't. Actually, I was worse than ever, and the dysphoria had flared so badly that I had started uh, cross-dressing again, going out, like staying after work. Actually, telling her that, telling family, telling Joyce that I was staying late to do research or something, and I would literally just go someplace, you know, go change. You know, and uh, put on makeup and just just do something really mundane, like go to the mall, just have a meal, just like kind of like being back in my mom's closet again as a kid. And I did that, of course. In the meantime, what I did, I surfed even harder, thinking I could get rid of it. But then, of course, making the trans, trans the making the the spore even worse. Uh, yeah, dumb move. Yeah, and looking back, of course, knew of course I was never going to work. But um, at the time, I was just desperate, and so. You know, you did that, you can only long you can keep that up for, especially the secrets I was keeping away from Joyce. So by Christmas 2012, Christmas day, 2012, you know, um, I think something else about the holidays. I think there's a lot of times where it's just an emotional time, but I think a lot of things come to a head. And I think um, I, um, I then I, uh, I, th I haven't been doing great. I think I'd really kind of withdrawn from the family. And I think, you know, Joyce even knew something was wrong. So, but I remember telling her on Christmas Day, said, hey, Joyce, said those same words again. We need to talk. Of course, there's no words no spouse ever wants to hear. So I remember, or, you know, when we were downstairs, I had the lights off. I couldn't even look her in the, I couldn't even look her in the face. And uh, with, it, it, this one this literally felt like an eternity, probably at least, at least 10, 15 minutes before I could actually get the words out and said, you know, Joyce, um, I've been told her I've been, cross-dressing again and I've been doing it for the past you know past couple years and you know I've been you know telling him and tell her that I've been you know doing it kind of in secret and um I think uh, for her of course and it was a mixture it was sort of like a it was it was confusing because I think for part of it she was of course when you you know when because she knows with you know kind of withdrawn I wasn't you know and she, of course, the first thought was that I was having an affair. But so it was, the first of all, there's a relief that it wasn't that. But also, though, that um, the thought was that maybe I was transgender, and uh, she, you know, she's an internist, and uh, and she's taking care of a lot of trans patients. But she also knows that how devastating it can be, especially because for me and Joyce, our marriage is the most important thing we have, and so and that's, and that's the most things most precious to us. I mean, she knows that that uh, most marriages don't survive transition. But at that time, she made a, she remember telling me later on, but she had in her mind, she had to make a decision. She could either decide that she could either be a speed bump or she said, or she could be sure she could be helpful. And despite how she felt her misgiving, she said, I'm gonna choose to be helpful. So at that point we decided we're gonna go through this together. 
and uh, and none of us pulling or pushing. Um, and I told her this, I was like, hey, if you say slow down, we slow down. We say stop, we stop. But we this is something we do together, you know? And uh, I think the fact was, I wanted her to know that I'm not, she's not being dragged along for the ride, that, that she's, you know, she's got a foot on the brake pedal. She's not a, she's not a victim. She's in control here. And so that's what we did. And so it wasn't much longer before I went to go see a, a physician for the first visit, you know, we had fun at Kaiser. We started having that, that was the year the early 2014 in 2013 where we had a registry of physicians who were you know were competent in transgender care someone made a call to member of services got connected to a family medicine physician who's become actually now one of my close friends but she uh, i remember talking to her it's only the second person i ever talked to for 30 minutes she, she didn't say a word but i was just telling my story by the end of it she was um i was in tears but i think we both knew what that all meant and um I remember she just kind of looked at me with a kind and the with all and with all kindness and and empathy and said, um, "Well, are you ready to start hormones?" And you know, and as scary as it was, I think Joyce and we've talked about it. And we said yes, and it's literally I think it was a point of felt like a point of no return. But we realized that this is the only way is the only way forward. So we did. So actually, we moved forward. But then what happened was. Like our, we had date nights and our date night, like my grandma would come over and watch the boys. We'd go out there and uh, like, um, and uh, we'd sneak out, uh, we'd go out there, we'd sneak a bag of clothes and stuff and supplies, you know, like with makeup and stuff. And uh, and so my wife always jokes, like if any of you ever need a uh, makeover by the, like the dim interior light of a Toyota Sienna minivan, she's your girl. So uh, we, uh, but do we go? We go someplace. She'd help me get ready, you know, do hair, put on clothes, and we we just go out there. We just go to like a someplace. We just go to a restaurant, again, go to a mall, and she could just see there while I was just, just being able to be. She could just see my my shoulders relax. That all of a sudden, I could actually I can manage a smile. But of course, even before we got home, she could see me tensing up again, and just uh, knowing that. This was this is only but like like feel like Cinderella like the clock strikes midnight you have to go back and and um, do it all over again just kind of be what everybody wants you to be expected to be and so we just you know we kept you know we did that and as the year went on one date night became two date nights a week and uh, the difference between how well I was doing when I was presenting as myself and then and versus when I was presenting male going to work and for everyone else the difference became worse and bigger and bigger until Christmas day 2013 and we're up a mammoth uh, for a ski trip and she uh, Joyce woke up that morning and um she noticed I and she I wasn't there. She I wasn't in there in bed. She found me lying on the floor in the middle of our a hotel room when I was curled up on the floor, fetal position. I don't even know how long I've been there for. I don't even know how I got there. All I remember that morning was I couldn't move on. I was like I couldn't. Um, I was hurting so badly. I just wanted the pain to stop. I was thinking I couldn't kill myself because I couldn't do that to Joyce or our boys, and um, and our boys. But also I couldn't transition fully transition because I couldn't do that to Joyce and the boys and so I was just hoping I could just something would happen I could just die and the pain would stop right there on the spot I just couldn't go on anymore but she came down she sat me and she got on the floor sat me up kind of held me by my arms and said you're going to be okay we're going to help you transition and you're going to be okay actually you're going to be better than okay you're going to be the best you've ever been and we as a family we're going to be the best we've ever been all I knew was, I don't know why I believed her, but I just couldn't move. But this is Christmas Day. Within 48 hours, you know, she, you know, she wrote every email, made every phone call, did all the research. She had found everything, um, like even found a surgical day for me. My biggest source, source of dysphoria was looking in the mirror, looking at a face that just wasn't mine, which it was just, and, um, and so for me, it was facial feminization surgery. That's my gender affirmation surgery. That's what I needed needed to move forward. So she found one, wasn't a covered benefit at the, at the time. So we actually had to get tickets, of, we had to fly to Chicago. And so she said, Allie, hang in there, just hang until March 1st. All you gotta do, the only two things I need you to do is the only things I can't do for you is go to your medical appointments and then also go to the courthouse for name and gender change. I couldn't do those for you. But there was hope. And she's the one who literally carried me, got us to Chicago, had surgery, two months, you know, about, about two months to recover. And by the time I, you know, 
uh, got back even at work. You know, I think there were people there who knew my story was going on and they went out of the way to make it a safe space for me, like a soft, like a safe landing spot. And so they're like, even our medical director kind of went in there and said, hey, we're going to make it okay. I'll just tell a quick story, remember, which I'll share with him before, because he could tell you me before I uh, I went off, had surgery, just, you know, I was talking to him, he said, you know, and he said, Allie, it hurts to see, it hurts me to see you hurting so badly. And said, and he and he said that the way I look at it, you know, there's only one option because the, the alternative is untenable. Because even that past year, it was, we actually had lost two two of our physicians to suicide. And it was a horrible year. And he said, and he said we're not losing a third. And he said, so we, we, you got this. So he said, he was telling me a story about how this one teenager came out, like in the, he was reading the newspaper. And Aaron is very conservative. He said, when he came out there, but nobody messed with him because the whole football team had his back. He said, he said, and he said, Ali, you don't only just have the whole football team. You have the principal behind you. It's going to be all right. We're going to make it okay. You just take care of yourself. We're going to take care of the rest. So that's what they did. You know, they made, they made, they went department to department. They, you know, they had physician leadership. They had multiple, multiple, like a little, like little sessions, like listening sessions, just kind of talking about like, hey, what does it mean to take care of someone who's trans? And so for the, and how do you love, and then like, what do you do? And most importantly, what don't you do? And why, do, and uh, then they, of course, shared this, then they read out a, a letter that I wrote a transition letter and they said um then they kind of like then by that point everybody was it was they were invested then it became personal said no and everybody was like no we're gonna do this we're gonna make it okay we're gonna make it for me they're gonna make it okay for me and that's what it was when i got back to work and uh and i've never experienced so much kindness they showed me more love than i could ever hoped or ever felt like i deserved and so um, my work family, even beyond my, 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 own, my own family, my work family. And so, and that's, um, and guess what? Seven years later, here we are now. And you know, Joyce was right. <laughs> I am the best I've ever been. Our family is the best we've ever been. And honestly, I couldn't be more grateful for what I have just because I've spent my whole, you're grateful because, especially grateful because you, especially when you spend your whole life dangling over the precipice and it feels, it just, you know, it's amazing to be on solid ground. And so, um, and I keep thinking because I had those resources and the privilege that I have as a trans person, I had Joyce, I had my family, I had my work family who went out of their way to make it okay. And also the fact was, you know, two physician income, I could afford gender affirming surgery. It was $40,000 out of pocket. That's a, that's a significant, significant barrier. That is one of those social determinants or SES. And that's, I realized that I was never more reckon, I'm never aware of my privilege. And so I know that because of my privilege, I had that chance to live my best life, but I know, but I will say, no, that's, everybody has a right to live their best life. And so that's what the fight was for, is to make sure that take away those barriers so they can be, so though all those things that I need, I, I, all, the, all the resources that I had available to me, that you wouldn't need any of that to be able to move forward to, 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 uh, to thrive. And so, so back then, it, it, so my, so now all the, everything that I needed to do, all that $40,000, now it's, no, that was back in 2014. Now it's uh, the part of the fight was actually having its first, I was the first person in Southern California, Kaiser to transition, the first openly transgender physician. And um, and so of course being the first means that you have to, you know, um, they experience even for the medical group they never had. So I kept telling people exactly, you know, of course there was like, as you know, they, they it was transgender care by cis people. And so for them, they're, they, for them, it was genitals equals gender. So that all they offered were bottom surgery. And I kept telling them, no, you don't understand. Trans people are, so uh, are every, every transition is different. Everybody needs something different. So that was it. You need trans people to inform transgender care. And so happy to say now it's 2021. And, and all that, all that $40,000 that I spent out of pocket, anybody who's a, um, who's a member can have all that, all those services, for a $200 copay. And I'm, I'm, I'm damn proud of that. I'm damn proud of an organization for transitioning. And, and that's the hope. 
And that's the fervent hope. And that's why it's important to have trans people in spaces so they can advocate, they can advocate for themselves or community. And also, and so that's what we can do. And that's what inclusion is all about. That's at the core. And so is, it's like, do you want to do right by trans people? Get trans people in the space. What do we do? You know, for if you're not trans is, you know, guess what? Amplify the voices, you know? You know, you know again, plug in the, you know, plug in the amp and pass the mic. But, you know, and because there's a lot of, you know, the trans people have, a, trans community has a lot, you know, there's a lot of things that we can do to make it, you know, um, we want to you know, move to move toward equity. And so do that, bring people and have those conversations. I know one more thing that uh, I know um, I was sharing with Nora, you know, we were talking earlier before this, and we're talking about even one of those experiences that I had back in 2014, it was only like six months after I transitioned and, uh, and, uh, I don't know, somehow I found myself because of a little casting call just to the trans community. This is the last year of Glee. This is 2014. And they were, for the last season, they wanted to do something for the trans community. And so they had one of the, like one of the storylines was Coach Beast was transitioning, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, and uh, as part of that though, as one of the, for one of those episodes, I think it was season six, episode seven. Um, I think that the name of the title was Transitions. What they wanted was a 200 person all transgender choir. And so they sent a call out to the community at that time, actually. You know, I just got like my, I saw my wife, Joyce, saying, do it. I just said, okay, all right, fine, on a lark. So I put, sent an email out, threw that out there. And before I knew it, I got a call from my casting director. And before I knew it, I was on set. Hungly, and I just said, "Oh my God!" I thought I traveled far. I live in Orange County. Driving to there, I wasn't. Um, quickly found out that people came from New York, people came from New Orleans, people came from Ohio, people came from all over around the country. And while I was there, before that, I had only known, I had only met like maybe five other trans people before, and so that was my experience. But while I was there, this person after person kept coming, until I met 199 other trans people. And what I saw was realizing that the trans community is just as diverse as the entire world, as any other community, as a human, as the human race. Like, you know, we are all different shapes, different colors, different ages, and, you know, all different SES, different levels of privilege. And I was always there very aware, became very aware of how much privilege I have because there are people there who were, who had to do sex work and people there who are homeless. But there was something special about just being with everyone there and realizing though that, I remember thinking to myself, said, wow, this is remarkable. It's breathtaking, the kaleidoscope, but also the fact that everybody here belongs. Everybody here has a place in this world. And, um, and I realized that when as different as we all are, we're all moving the same direction. We're, each of us are here to help each other move forward. And then, and also I think even up to that point, I was still a little, I was still on the way to being like, you know, sort of like, like even being self-affirming, being okay with myself, being self-inclusive, getting over, you know, all those being finally embracing who I am. And I remember, you know, I, after the whole thing, I remember talking to Joyce about it. And she said, you know, Ali, I think the reason why I feel different now is because you realize all these people have a, you know, have a place in this world. And what that means is you, Ali, like me, I have a place in this world as well. And so that's what it is. This is what I'm passionate about. This is what I'm so glad I have. And as a physician, that, that privilege, that platform, the amplified voice. So I could, I could amplify these stories to make sure that everybody here has a chance and that their stories are amplified and they have a seat at the table. And one thing new about privilege too is this, realizing that it doesn't have a seat at the main table, but you don't realize how much privilege you have until it's gone. Like even in the medicine, being an Asian cisgender male, heterosexual male, honestly, there's a lot of privilege that comes with that. You don't realize how much you have until it's gone. And so, but once you don't, you know, one thing though about once, once you're at the main, when you're at the main table, you don't see everybody else who doesn't have a seat. All you're aware, you're not aware of it, but when you're actually not there, then you can see it, look around the room and see everybody who doesn't have a seat. And you realize that, then you know who you're fighting for. You're fighting for everybody who doesn't have a seat. And also too, is one thing I always want to you know, share is this, what I learned is this, that I may not, I will never fully understand their journeys, their stories, what it means to be, because of their skin color, what it means to be black, what it means to be Latinx, 
what it means to her, even um, all these other marginalized groups, I may understand, but that doesn't, that's not, you know, that doesn't stop me from loving. That won't stop me from loving them, advocating for them and just having compassion. Because one thing I didn't just want to leave, you know, I want to be able to leave with you all today is that, um, you know, understanding is not a prerequisite to compassion or love. So um, thank you all. I appreciate you even yeah, giving this time and space, making a safe space to, so for you, for me and Dr. Pham to be able to share our stories. And I know y'all have questions as well. I want to hand this back to Nora. Um, thank you all again. Wow, thank you. Thank you so, so much. We got, um, I don't know if you can see, yeah, lots, lots of thank yous in the chat for sharing and and being so vulnerable with us. Yeah, we, we really appreciate it. And, and we're really glad that we have both of you. Um, we have both of you as healthcare providers, as MDs at a time when it's so critical, not only during COVID, but just it's, incredible. it's critical to have um, transgender non-binary physicians. So we do have, uh, we have seven minutes. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again. These were questions that um, that we selected from the registrations. We had that field for people to, to send in questions. So I'm gonna let April read these off and our, have our panelists answer. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Nora. Thank you so much, Dr. Tao and Dr. Pham. Um, I just wanted to just say one thing that um, the, I'm trying to find it, is in the chat. Um, the Arkansas governor vetoed the anti-trans um, bill. So, you know, that, you know, that's good news. <laughs> um, so for question, um, first one, what services, organizations, programs, mentors, um, et cetera, do you wish you had, um, do you wish had been available to you in med school and res residency? Oh, oh, I can answer part of that. You know, um, Dr. Tao, Ali mentioned like the privilege that we have as physicians and getting to this point, you know, one of the things that I um, am really thankful for is uh, in med school at UTESCA, you know, um, this is when you're a student, you're learning, you, you, everyone is your role model. And so I was able to have like a classmates who supported me um, in my queerness, um, uh, a attending physician who supported the pride group and there was a pride group there. And I think a lot of med students and med schools don't have a, have a safe space. And so one of the things that um, the program did was advocate for having safe spaces, advocate for um, teaching these young, um, young soon-to-be physicians um, how to create a safe space and how to support each other. Um, you know, like medicine is hard, um, and so uh, having the services, um, a safe space, um, mental health, mental health, um, having organizations like. Uh, a student run pride a faculty group that you know um, mentors and programs to help help facilitate growth and um, acceptance and compassion um, and then that and that's in med school and residency I was the only out resident um, gender non-conforming in my program. So that was one of the things that I wanted to do to for future future residents, future staff, future attendings to be in that program. I wanted there to be a place where they can go to to feel acceptance and not start from the beginning again. You know, I want so that's kind of one of the things that I wish um, that I that there was available um, throughout my training. You know. Dr. Tao, did you want to add anything? Okay, well, um, outing myself in terms of well, I don't know how old my age, but I started medical school back in 1994, and back then there was nothing, zero, and so all of that, <clears throat> so all that, all of that, that 
I wish I got a, even a fraction. I wish I had some, I wish I had what Dr. Fan had, but also too is, you know, honestly, I could have really used some visibility. I could, I could have used a mentor. I could have vis I could have used visibility and a mentor. There was nobody I could even identify with. I didn't even know it was possible to that you could, you know, you could talk about this, that you could come out. And so uh, a lot of it is you just sort of, you just, uh, all you do is kind of just, you know, suffer in silence. That's what it was. So maybe that's exactly, that's the hope is to build safe spaces now. And that's why Dr. Fam and I are here for, for the sake of not just visibility, but also to, to help gather allies like yourselves to, to you know, um, to create these safe spaces. And uh, so, yeah, I wish, Wish I had all of that. Maybe that wouldn't have been 41 years. I wouldn't have to be 41 before I transitioned if there was actually knew what was possible. So, so how can um, how can one be inclusive um, and be an ally? I think the the first step is to be open to learning because that's like everyone is learning about pronouns. That's like a, a really concrete example of, um, you know, introducing yourself and then introducing your pronouns as a, as a normal, like normal, normal way to introduce yourself to not um, assume, you know, this, I think a lot of um, cisgender people, you know, you have, you go, uh, like Ali said, um, you know, when they're not a seat at the table, you know, people assume you're male or female and you have, you go through your life without having to correct someone um, because like your uh, people's assumptions of you match how you feel yourself. And so going through and, you know, not kind of looking at your own bias and kind of um, learning to be gender inclusive using um, gender neutral terms. And um, that's, like one one step that can be you know and being compassionate like these are other human beings right to uh, like how to treat other fellow humans bring in trans people you want to be inclusive and be an ally bring in trans people into all these spaces bring them especially bring non-binary uh, folks because that's um there's so many misunderstandings there's so much for it's not it's it's so much for the rest of us, including myself, who doesn't identify the gender non-conforming, that uh, for us to learn, get the pronouns right, to be respectful, to be affirming, to, you know, uh, to celebrate, to be, you know, to celebrate. And so, so when you know, even the next question is like, what has been most effective forms of advocacy is actually just bringing uh, trans people into all the spaces where decisions are made. Okay, great. Um, I guess one more. Um, what is being done to instruct member services staff and reception about um, proper uh, pronouns? Um, I mean, even within, so before I started uh, at Kaiser, you know, one of the things that um, I guess my chief did was, you know, tell everyone like, hey, this is going to be a new physician coming in. Um, their pronouns are they, them, and then, you know, inform everyone that I work with. Um, one of the things that we're currently working with is to, and this is part of advocacy and within the health system, is um, having a, having our electronic medical record um, be uh, used so that, you know, gender nonconforming and transgender people can um, you know, it flags on their their medical record when the chart pulls up so that, you know, it's it's very tiring, you know, to always have to correct or be on the lookout for like, oh, did you misgender me? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it takes it away off, takes away from the wondrous or the responsibility of the person. And so it makes it everyone so that, you know, that it's not the person's responsibility. It's everyone's there. Um, another one is we're working on a module to teach, um, to have people, um, so just educate on what is pronouns, you know, something um, as simple as that. Um,
Thank you both very much. Nora, I will turn it over to you. Since we're at time. All right, yes, yes, we are at time, but again, thank you so, so much. We are all really grateful. I'm really happy that that we were able to connect and that you um, that you agreed to to come on and share your experiences with us. So Rebecca has posted in the chat the link to our evaluation and the instructions for those of you that are interested to receive CE credit from the Medical Library Association. Lots of thank yous. Lots of thank yous. Thank you all for just for your hearts, to want, your desire to be here. And thank you for making this a safe space. Um, uh, we deeply appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, and I think, you know, people are asking about what they can do, what they can do to make things better. So I think something as simple as sharing this recording and, and you know, in whatever space you're working in, whether it's healthcare, in a library, a CBO, sharing people's, stories and experiences is one step toward creating change at, at an institutional level. All right, well, I am going to end our recording now, um, but thank you all for coming and um, be sure to tune in next week, um, next Monday, April 12th, 2021, we have our, our last uh, webinar and this one is going to focus on mental health and resiliency. So I will send out the link for that to register as well. Thank you, Dr. Tao and Dr. Fayon.